many of you would maybe say that sometimes you struggle to kind of bite your tongue or hold back what you want to say? Is that ever really a problem for you? You know, sometimes it's not such a bad thing to want to bite your tongue because, you know, maybe it's for something good. Maybe you've got a surprise plan for someone and you don't want to let the cat out of the bag. You don't want to let them know what's about to happen, so you hold it back, you bite your tongue. But other times, maybe it's not for good reasons. Maybe it's a little bit harder because, you know, maybe sometimes somebody kind of gets on your nerves or somebody maybe kind of irritates you. You don't want to hold your tongue then, do you? Then you want to let them know what you think. You want to tell them how it is. Well, as we get into God's Word today, in essence, we sort of discover that God talks as if He's been kind of holding back, as if He has been biting His tongue on what He's about to do. See, in the book of Isaiah, God's got some big plans. He's got some big ideas, and He's just got to let everybody know. And I like these words today from Isaiah because God gets kind of dramatic on us. We sort of see some of his passion, some of his excitement today through his word. God says, I've got a plan, now I've got to let it out. Look at verse 14. God says, for a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. Kind of surprising how God compares himself today. He says he's like a woman in labor. Going through all that pain, just ready to, to let it all out. God says it's like this. His news is so big. His plan is so broad. He's just got to say something. And to top it all off, God says nothing's going to stop what he's about to do. Just like when a woman goes into labor, you know, there's no turning back. Well, once God gets his plans in order, there's no turning back. Nothing can stop him. And if we don't believe that God gives us this picture from nature, he says that he's going to lay waste mountains and hills, dry up the vegetation, turn rivers into islands, dry up the pools. Basically says, God says nothing can stop him. You know, you think about it, if we wanted to travel over to Nevada, if we wanted to drive over there, there's this big old chain of mountains It's kind of in our way, right? You can't just take the 198 and keep going. you got to maybe go up to the Tioga Pass, or you got to go all the way down to Bakersfield, and then go east that way. Because those mountains are in our way. We can't get past them. Well, God says nothing is going to stand in His way. No mountain, no river, no pool, no anything can stop what he is going to do. All right, so he's been talking it up for us, getting us kind of excited. What's God's plan? What does he want to do? What do you think? What would you expect? If God says he's been holding back and now he's going to let it out, what might he talk about? Maybe we'd expect that news to be, you know, judgment, bad news, anger, wrath. Not so. The Lord says here that he is going to begin to open people up to the truth. See, this part of Isaiah is pretty exciting. In chapter 42, God's plan is to bring forth his servant in the world. And that servant God has planned to come to the world is going to do things we could never imagine. He tells us that this servant will establish justice. He's going to release those who have been imprisoned in life. He's going to watch over people who are struggling. And he is not for one moment going to tire from his work. That's exciting news because what it all boils down to is this. When God sees the struggle of his people, it moves him to act. Across the board in the scriptures, that's what you always see. God sees the struggle of his people. It moves him to act. That's a reality that you and I need to be opened up to more and more all the time. What we need to see is that in God is life. Like we could never imagine. I mean, that answer is kind of obvious, right? Because God's our creator. He's the one who made every single one of us. 
But on top of that, God brings even more life than just creation. See, God redeems and saves his people from the destructive power of sin and death. God brings every kind of life imaginable to his people. As you read through here in Isaiah, you know, you get the idea that you know where this is all going. The beginning of the chapter that we don't have there on the back of your, your bulletin, that God talks about sending this servant, talks about all the great things he's going to do, like basically turn the world upside down, make things the way they're supposed to be. Who do you think he's talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about his son. And it's pretty incredible because Isaiah's written a long time before Jesus ever walked the earth. There's this 400 year gap between the last book of the Old Testament and Jesus' arrival in the world. But even before that, Isaiah goes before that. He goes between all the exile, all the troubles God's people had. Yet here in Isaiah's words, it's almost like we're getting a, a play by play of what Jesus does in the Gospels. You can put Isaiah next to Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, and it, it almost seems like he's talking about the same thing. Because he is. Because he's talking about the work of God's servant, Jesus Christ. Because that's the thing. God tells it like it is. And you know what? Sometimes that's really good news. You look at Jesus and you see perfectly God's servant. You see the one who releases us from all kinds of prisons. The one who released us from the prison of sin by his death on the cross. You see the one who can release us from that prison of death by his resurrection from the grave. You look at Jesus and you see that one who did watch out for those who are struggling. Who Isaiah says we're just barely hanging on. We're like a, a smoldering wick, just about to be snuffed out. But that's the ones Jesus came for. See, he didn't come to drive us away from God or to remind us that our lives are broken. Instead, he came to restore us. He came to draw us back to our Heavenly Father. The Lord says this plan is being enacted. And there is nothing that's going to stop it. See, that's important for us to see. Because how many of you have made plans before? Only to see them come to nothing. How many times have you maybe looked at life and you thought, I got, I got everything mapped out. I know exactly how it's all going to play out. And then something comes along and it changes everything. We don't like that. But here with God, He makes promises and His promises are always definitely fulfilled. There's something else though that we need to see in these words. See, right now the Lord's telling it like it is and it sounds great, right? He's bringing His servants and be fulfilled through Jesus and we like that. But now God's got to talk about truth a little bit more. He's got to speak to the hearts and the minds of his people, especially his people, Israel. Because there's problems. See, the people of Israel turned away from their God, and they've begun to worship idols. Now, if you spend much time looking at the scriptures, what conclusion do you come to when you... Think about God and think about idols. Not a big fan of those things, is he? God never likes to share his authority or his name or his divinity or his power with anyone or anything else. The reason? God doesn't like people to pretend. God doesn't like it when humanity bases their lives and their faith on fiction. God wants us to see the truth. Idols are not real. Idols are not living. They cannot do anything for you. Look what he says in verse 17. He says, They are turned back and utterly put to shame who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, You are our gods. Now the Lord's words here don't exactly fit modern day culture, do you? you know, the Lord comes here and he says, 
We can't just do whatever you want. We can't necessarily believe anything you want. We like to think that sometimes. We like to think it doesn't matter at all. We like to say, if you shouldn't get involved, somebody else's beliefs. You get the feeling here in Isaiah, the Lord likes to get involved. The Lord likes to kind of interfere. He likes to put his opinions out there and leave everything else in the dust. His people, the ones he claimed as his own, have turned aside from him and are worshiping statues, things made out of metal and wood. They're basing their lives on fiction, and God doesn't want that to happen. Now, I brought with me this morning, I went digging in my garage and found some metal for us. What should we do with this? Should we, should we put this up on the altar this morning and worship this here in church? You don't want to do that, right? I also found some wood out in my garage. You know, maybe one of you who's kind of good at building things, you know, maybe you could make this into a statue for us. Maybe you could do something with this piece of wood. You know, we could maybe draw a little face on it, like a smiling, happy face, and Call it God, right? Nobody wants to do that. It's ridiculous. It's silly. We don't want to worship this piece of wood or these metal things I think go to like, I don't know, many blinds or something like that. I don't even remember where they go to. We don't want to do this yet. This is exactly what God's people were doing in the Old Testament. They're taking metal, they're taking wood. And they're turning it into a God. And you know, maybe you wouldn't think that's such a big deal. You see, the Lord had done a whole lot of things to him. Their entire identity was based upon him. It was based on this promise God made to a man named Abraham. He told him, leave your country, leave your hometown, move to a new land where I'm going to establish you as my people. Abraham did it. God began to build his people up. Later on, though, those people ran into trouble. They had been enslaved in Egypt. But you know what? The Lord came to their rescue. He delivered them out of that bondage and brought them back home where they belong. He fed them with manna from heaven, the special food God gave them. He appeared to them in the temple and their worship. He forgave their sins. He did all this stuff for them. And then they turned around and they decided, let's worship this and this instead. So you can almost understand why God's a little, a little irritated with this. Why he wants his people to turn aside from these things and come back to him. He reminds them today, the plain truth, he tells it like it is. These things are not alive. These things have done nothing for you. So it makes you wonder, why did the people want to worship this kind of stuff? Why do they want to call this their God? Well, there's a couple of reasons. See, the first is it was popular. Israel wasn't off by its own. There were other nations, other peoples around them. They all worshipped gods that were made out of this kind of stuff. And so the people of Israel decided, we better be like them. We better follow the crowd, do the same thing. But there's another much deeper reason than that. See, when you make a god out of wood or metal, you get to decide what that God is like. You get to manipulate them. You get to have them say whatever you want to hear and do whatever you want them to do. That God has to listen to you. Whereas you have to listen to the true and living God. Now that would be a wonderful thing if we could say, you know, all this has been left behind. It's just a relic from the past, right? It's just something ancient people used to do and not really much place for that anymore, right? But unfortunately, that's not the case. See, people still follow after idols. People still follow gods that are a whole lot more fiction than they are real life. There's a lot of times where we sort of turn aside from that creator and redeemer we know so well. There's a lot of times where people even worship things made out of wood and metal, but we don't necessarily call them God anymore. Call them money or possessions or homes or success or career. There's a lot of times we follow our own ideas. Sometimes those idols stare us in the mirror 
when we get up in the morning, when our own ideas and our own desires and our own thoughts supersede those of the true and living God, then we're looking at an idol. Here in Isaiah, the Lord himself said, okay, enough of this. Let's go back to reality, folks. Let's go back to the truth. Really what we could do with Isaiah's words today is look at them as a challenge and a test. What kind of God is really worth following? What kind of God is worth building your whole life, everything around? According to Isaiah, it's the true and living God. It's the one who will act on behalf of his people. It's the one who won't wait for us to shape up, but rather will actually come into the world and do all the work that we need. It's a God who's not a unmoving, made of statue kind of, kind of piece of stone, but it's a God who truly is alive, who speaks and walks and talks and moves. Isaiah tells us, you find that kind of God. Trust in Him. Follow Him. And here in Isaiah this morning, the Lord is bold enough to say, He is that God. He's bold enough to say, You should follow me above everything else. And you want to know why? Because I can pass that test. See, it's funny. When you look at that servant talked about here in Isaiah, fulfilled through Jesus Christ, you see something that you just don't find out in the world. You see a God who actually says, I'm going to show my face in the world. I'm going to come down to you. I'm going to live with you, teach you, and I'm even going to die for you. I challenge you. Find another God who claims they will give their life for you, not when you were good, not when you were trying your best, but when you were a sinner. Jesus makes that claim. And he backs it up with his actions. He died for us. Not because we deserved it or asked for it, but solely out of his love and his grace. I challenge you, find another God who can promise you eternal life, but then also back it up with his own resurrection from the dead. Jesus has done that for us. He has risen from the dead. He says, believe in me, and you too will live. Where else will we find? Where else can we go? See, there's nothing in the world that will offer us those things. We can't love ourselves in that way. I can't give my life for myself. I can't make myself live forever. But Jesus, I can't go to a store and buy the forgiveness of my sin or buy eternal life. It's not on the shelves at Walmart. But I can find that free of charge through Jesus Christ. So the Lord again tells it like it is today. He says, hear you deaf, and look you blind, so that you may see. See, again, the Lord states the obvious here. Again, he says, you know, turn to me instead of this kind of stuff. But the idea is not just so God can be angry or can be mean or anything like that. God's goal here is so that you may see. So that you can live in reality and live in truth. See, the fact of the matter is, is that sometimes life's pretty simple. The Lord tells us today, you trust in me. You trust in the one who gave his life for you and who rose from the dead. And you'll live. Simple as that. You look to him. This God who makes things happen on our behalf when we didn't ask for it, when we didn't deserve it. And you'll find love. People of Israel here in the Old Testament unfortunately learned this all the hard way. They had forsaken the Lord. They turned to this kind of God. Trouble came their way. Their enemies began to attack them. They were poor. They were destitute. Who was there to help? You know, that, that piece of wood didn't get up and march against their enemies. That piece of metal didn't provide them food and shelter and everything they needed. It didn't love them. 
See, when trouble came, those people were left with nothing to stand on. They had everything they needed when they had the Lord. But without Him, they had nothing. With the Lord, we find life. God wants us to live. That is His design. Just like John 3.16 tells us. God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. Isaiah told us plainly today, that was the plan of God all along. To give His people life. To give them salvation. To send this servant. The great thing about it, we see God tells it like it is. He doesn't give us maybes, hopefully, if, or opinion. God says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you life through my servant, my son. He died for you. He rose for you. You can trust that. You can base your whole life and existence upon it. And you will live. So the question remains for us today. What God do we want? Do we want ones made out of this? Or made out of this? Or one that, that came from up here? Or do we want the God that we find up there? Dying for us on the cross. Do we want the God who didn't stay up there, but rose from the dead? And based on that certainty, promise that you will live forever. Which do we want? Let's go to God. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that your words are true, that your plans are fulfilled. We thank you, Lord, that you are the true and living God who doesn't stay stationary, who doesn't stand far away from us, but instead came into the world and made things happen on our behalf. We think that we can base our lives on what you have done, dying for us, rising again, giving us life. Lord, help us when we struggle, help us when we doubt, to stand strong and believe in you. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.